Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Lucky Speech Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel, the Lucky Peach. Hello. Um, today's episode is a monthly review. Whoa, 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 whoa. Um, that is where I review something that recently released. My method for choosing those films is usually I just pick something that released the previous month. So the film I chose for this month was released in December. I do that because it's just easier on my brain. If I limit myself to a certain span of time of what I can pick, so that way it's not too recent and not too, like, not recent, whatever that be called. Not old, because it's not, because I'm not old, like, you know what I mean? But, yeah. Um, no new information, like, no, no, uh, things that uh, go over really, I don't know, uh, nothing interesting has happened, um, um, yeah, nothing, nothing cool has happened in my life, um, if you listened to the episode last week, called of the month, you'll know that the stickers are out, so go check that out, the stickers are at Kofi, K-O-F-I.com, uh, forward slash the luckiest peach so the stickers are there if you would like to go check them out i would very much appreciate it also if you uh i haven't had a, if you place an order now you get one of the labels on <laughs> your package when the first orders came in my labels had not been delivered yet so those unfortunately did not get the labels but if you order now you get the labels um, I don't know. Yeah, nothing cool has happened in my life recently. Um, I think I mentioned this last week. I got my screeners for the uh, Independent Spirit Awards, and I have just been powering through them. That's really all I've done on my days off. Um, Jesus Christ. Sorry, if you hear loud noises, it's my brother in the backyard. Um, but yeah, I, I powered through them a lot last week. I got through all of the television, uh, categories in, like, the span of a couple days. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm getting there. Um, that's, like, the only thing that's happened. I don't know. Yeah, no, I went to the neurologist again. <laughs> Um, I, I don't know. Uh, the Nerdcore is up and running again after, I think, like a month that they had off. Um, so that's fun. I'm, I really missed it. I really missed being on those shows. So I'm happy to see my friends again. Um, what else? I don't know. My grandma turned 80 last, well, at the time you're listening to this, it happened two weeks ago, but she, she turned 80 this month. It's not really interesting. I don't like my grandma. My grandma's uh, uh, a Trump supporter. She's pretty fucking racist, so I don't like her. But, um, yeah. I spent that day by watching uh, documentaries that would piss her off. So, that was nice. Um, yeah. Nothing, nothing else interesting has happened in my life. You know what? That just reminds me. As I'm looking at my calendar, I need to get my Sundance tickets. That's totally fine. Um, yeah, that's that's it. I don't have like a 15 minute um, side story to go on. Nothing, nothing cool. I don't know if I already went over this. I can't remember, but I did apply um for press at uh south by southwest and i didn't get it which that's fine i don't that's no big deal it's understandable um i didn't expect it um but they offered me like the lowest possible rate for packages uh i guess it has like um consolation for not uh, getting the press accreditation and 
um, the prices were just stupid high. <laughs> like, I know the reason the prices are so high is because South by Southwest wants to be exclusive, like the other more prestigious film festivals. But um, I don't think it really got through their heads that even the other more prestigious festivals are affordable. They're still affordable. Like, the lowest package at... Um, Sundance's was a hundred bucks. The lowest package at South by Southwest, um, currently, not including that email, just like in general for the general public, the lowest price for a package is eleven hundred dollars. The lowest price that they offered me was eight hundred and ninety-five dollars. Like the fuck? I don't I don't understand. Like, they want to look more exclusive, but in that, they're actually, they're actually looking very classist and elitist. So, uh, get fucked. Get fucked. As somebody who lives in Texas and absolutely hates the state and wants to leave and go to a place that would be more accepting of me and my identity, um, Austin can get fucked. Like, I know Austin is the one city where I would be most accepted for my identity, but it's elitist and classes as fuck. I have no desire to live there. Um, anyways, yeah, I just thought that was ridiculous. I, I wasn't even mad that I didn't get the press accreditation. I didn't care. I was more upset that they called $895 a discount and the lowest possible. Like, that pissed me off because I was like, are you serious? Like, it, may, it led me down a whole rabbit hole of looking up how much um, other festivals cost for their lowest package. And even con, which you do have to have a badge of sorts. You have to have an approved badge um, to attend, uh, which just means you got to be involved in the industry or whatever. But, um, but like, I don't think the badges are that hard to get. But even then, the lowest possible badge for um con is like i think like 40 dollars american for con you know and like i said the lowest price for sundance for a package uh, is the day package uh where you get four films for a single day is a hundred dollars like what i don't understand I don't understand because like the like Sundance is one of those more prestigious festivals and even then it's easier to get in and it's more affordable so what I don't get it I I don't understand a single thing that that city does um they try like to me it looks like they try really hard to look exclusive in like LA and like oh we're so so hip and cool and everyone's everyone's accepted but like they more so just look elitist and classist like you're not doing what you think you're doing you're not no you're not the the liberal mecca that you think you are especially with the capital being there like the <laughs> That whole big ass building full of Republicans, excuse me. Anyways, that's I digress. Um, I don't like this state at all. I would rather not live in this state, but um, if I'm gonna live anywhere in this state, it's gonna be in the city that I currently live in. So, yeah, if I ever decide, and not if, I mean, when I eventually get out of this awful fucking excuse of a state um yeah I, I will be moving somewhere else eventually i don't know but uh that's not gonna be anytime soon because i'm broke but yeah that, that being said i just wanted to i just i don't know i kind of just wanted to go on a rant about that because i was very bothered by that i was like i think i might still have the no i finally deleted it yesterday actually might still have a screenshot though. No, I don't. 
I deleted it. I put it behind me. Okay, that's fine. I was just like the audacity, the absolute audacity to call $895 for a single package. Not like a package that includes multiple things, just one single package. The lowest possible discount. What? I The audacity. I just... If anything, if anything, it shows that not just Austin, but Texas as a whole only has the audacity. But I digress. <laughs> Moving on. Moving on. Moving on from elitism and uh, capitalism. Uh, today's review is of uh, Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley. Woo, 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 woo. I'm just going straight into it because I have nothing interesting else to say about my life. Um, and I'd rather not keep going on that rant about South by Southwest. Um, yeah. Uh, so, Nightmare Alley uh, is a 2021 American neo-noir psychological thriller film directed by Guillermo del Toro from a screenplay by del Toro and Kim Morgan based on the 1946 novel of the same name by William Lindsay Gresham. Uh, it is the second feature film adaptation of Gresham's novel following the 1947 film. Uh, it focuses on Stan Carlyle and... Oh, wait, 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 I'm going to read that later. Um, what else? What else? Um, this is Del Toro's first film since Shape of Water in 2017. Um, principal photography, oh, uh, no, 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 okay, I don't need to read all that, but anyways, directed by Guillermo del Toro, screenplay by Guillermo del Toro and Kim Morgan, uh, it's produced by J. Miles Dale, Guillermo del Toro, and Bradley Cooper, cinematography is by Dan Laustsen, it's edited by Cam McLaughlin, music is by Nathan Johnson, um, the production companies are TSG Entertainment and Double Dare You Productions. It was distributed by Searchlight Pictures, so unfortunately, there's no hope of it being added to the fucking Criterion Collection with the 1947 film, which is in it, because um, Disney owns Searchlight Pictures. So, yeah. If you had any hope that any of the more recent uh, Del Toro or um, Wes Anderson films would be added to the Criterion Collection, they won't. They won't. Disney won't allow that. Disney puts their IPs in a stranglehold. No one else is allowed to distribute them at any fucking costs. Anyways, um, <laughs> um. It released on December 17th, 2021. The runtime is 150 minutes. Um, the budget was $60 million in the box office. Unfortunately, but also is indicative of the fact that we still live in a pandemic. The box office was $8.8 .8 million. Uh, when I say indicative of the pandemic, I mean we are in a surge of omicron so like this this fucking strain what is it called mutation what is it called it's not uh, this version of covid is unrelentless man it is fucking it doesn't play it doesn't play you know it's getting people that have both doses it got my mom, got my brother. Well, no, my brother was unvaccinated when he got it. So that's his fault. 100% um, his fault. Um, Raul got it. Like, it's a lot of people are getting it. I am lucky enough. I got my booster, like, I think, like, a week before people started getting, <laughs> getting it. Like, before it really started spreading. So I kind of just just caught the mark before I would have gotten it. Um, but that doesn't mean I won't get it. I don't know. Probably still can. I'm just better. I'm just, you know, protected better from it. Um, anyways, but, um, 
that's what I mean when I said like the box office numbers are low. Like it makes a lot of sense because it also released another reason. There's another reason the box office could be low is like it released the same weekend as Spider Man No Way Home, which um, obviously is still making millions of dollars. Um, probably hundreds of millions at this point. Uh, no, yeah, for sure. It had the biggest opening weekend, I think, of some some movie or other. But it broke some kind of box office record. But, um, yeah. I mean, I consider that the uh, most recent uh, super spreader event. Um, which I don't... I, I actually went to see it in theaters, so I can't. I know better than everyone else that went to go see it. It's just, I'm lucky you didn't get it. But anyways, <laughs> uh, it also premiered next to fucking Spider-Man No Way Home. So like that makes a lot of sense aside from the fact that we're still very much in a pandemic that will most likely last another five to six years. Um, so with the plot, Stanton, Stan, Carlisle, burns down his Midwestern home and takes a job as a carny. When the traveling carnival's geek becomes ill, owner Clem enlists Stan to help him dispose of the man. Stan is disturbed at how any man could sink to the level of performing as a freak, living in a Cajun squalor, and biting off the he heads of live chickens to appease the crowd. Clem explains that he seeks out alcoholics or drug addicts who are often men with troubled pasts and lures them in with promises of a temporary job and opium-laced alcohol. Oh, that was the end of that sentence, I'm sorry. Um, he uses their dependence <laughs> to physically and mentally abuse them until they sink into madness and depravity, thus creating a geek for his carnival. Clem then shows Stan where he stores the moonshine he brews to control the carnies, warning him not to mistake it for the wood alcohol he stores nearby. Stan works with clairvoyant act Madame Zena and her alcoholic husband Pete. Zena and Pete use cold reading in an genius coded language system to make it seem that she has extraordinary mental powers, which Pete begins to teaching to Stan. He and Zena warn Stan not to use these skills to continue leading patrons on when it comes to the dead, what they call a spook show. They always inform customers afterward that the show is a deception, otherwise people get hurt. Meanwhile, Stan becomes att attracted to fellow performer Molly and a purchaser with an idea for a two-person act away from the carnival. One night, Stan, possibly accidentally, uh, gives Pete the wrong bottle and the old man dies from consuming wood alcohol. In the aftermath, Stan swears his love to Molly and reiterates his plan to her. She accepts and they leave the carnival behind. Two years later, Stan has successfully reinvented himself as the Great Stanton. A uh, psychic act for the wealthy urban elite of New York, along with Molly as his assistant, using Xena and Pete's techniques. During a performance, their act is interrupted by psychologist Dr. Lilith Ritter, who attempts to expose their code system. Stan's cold reading allows him to best Ritter, keeping their act safe while publicly humiliating her. He is later approached by the wealthy Judge Kimball, who employed Ritter to test Stan. He is now convinced of Stan's abilities and offers to pay him handsomely to allow him and his wife to communicate with their dead son. Despite Molly's objection to the spook show, Stan agrees. Ritter invites Stan to her office, knowing that he is a con man. She's nevertheless intrigued by his manipulative skill. Through her recorded sessions with her clients, she has accumulated sensitive information about various members of New York's social elite. Finding themselves to be kindred spirits, she and Stan begin an affair, and they conspire together to manipulate Kimball with Ritter, secretly providing private information to fuel his charade. She also begins therapy sessions with Stan, who reveals his guilt over Pete's death and his hatred of his alcoholic father, who he killed in their home before joining the carnival. Kimball introduces Stan to the powerful and sinister Ezra Grendel, whose illegitimate lover, Dory, died of a forced abortion. Despite warnings from Ritter that Grendel is dangerous, Stan begins to scam Grendel and as well as starting to drink. Oh, no, it's also the end of that sentence. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Ritter feeds information to Stan to use to scam Grendel. She manipulates Stan to hurt Grendel as revenge for him previously attacking her. She shows Stan a scar down her chest and abdomen that she received from Grindel. 
Molly becomes increasingly uncomfortable and upon learning of the affair with Ritter, leaves Stan. He begs her to stay, but she refuses, only agreeing to help him one last time. She poses as Dory for Stan's ultimate act, conjuring Dory from afar for Grindel. However, he loses control of Grindel, who reveals himself to be a violent abuser of many women over his guilt for Dory, then embracing Molly before she can exit. Upon realizing that Dory is a fake, he becomes enraged and promises to destroy Stan. Stan beats Grendel to death, then kills his henchman, Anderson, during their escape before Molly leaves Stan for good. Stan goes to Ritter for help, but discovers she has been scamming him all along, revealing that she wanted revenge for what happened during her fir their first encounter. She expresses disappointment in realizing that he was nothing more than a base, money-driven criminal. Ritter contacts the police and threatens to use her recordings of their sessions as evidence that he is mentally disturbed should he try to implicate her. Ritter shoots Stan in the ear and he tries to strangle Ritter, but the police arrive and he flees. Wanted, injured, and with nowhere else to go, Stan hides in a train and wanders around for years as a hobo sunk into alcoholism. At his limit, he tries to get a job as a mentalist at another carnival. The owner turns him away but offers him a drink and a temporary job as the new geek at the last minute. Finally broken, Stan agrees, saying, Mr. I was born for it. He begins laughing before it gradually turns into sobbing. <sighs> Full circle. Um, the cast has Bradley Cooper as Stanton, Stan Carlisle, uh, Kate Blanchett as Loth Ritter, Tony Collette, Queen, as Zena Crumbine, uh, Willem Dafoe, King, as Clem Hotley. Uh, Richard Jenkins as Ezra Grindel, Rooney Mara as Molly, uh, Ron Perlman as Bruno. Uh, Ron Perlman also collaborates with uh, Del Toro, like I think in almost all of his films. Um, Mary Steenburgen as Miss Kimball, David Strathairn, Strathairn, uh, Strathairn as P. Crumbine, uh, Holt McKelleny as Anderson. Uh, Clifton Collins Jr. as Funhouse Jack, Tim Blake Nelson as the Carney Boss, Jim Beaver as uh, a Sheriff, uh, Peter McNeil as Judge Kimball, uh, um, is there any other fucking, no, what am I, I don't know why, okay, okay, oh, this is information. Important. Uh, Romina Power cameos as a viewer of Stan's show. Power is the daughter of the original 1947 film star Tyrone Power. He played Stan in the 1947 film. So uh, the project was announced in December 2017 when Del Toro revealed that he would be attached to write and direct a film adaptation of the novel. Uh, the film marks a departure from Del Toro as it contains no supernatural elements as opposed to his previous films. Uh, Zorro considered this to be a standalone adaptation of the novel as opposed to a remake of the 1947 film. Uh, he stated, quote, uh, well, what it is, is that book was given to me in 1992 by Ron Perlman before I saw the Tyrone Power movie, and I loved the book. My adaptation that I've done uh, with Kim Morgan is not necessarily the, in not necessarily, the entire book is impossible, it's a saga. But there are elements that are darker in the book, and it's the first chance I have in my short films I wanted to do noir. It was horror and noir, and now is the first chance I have to do a real underbelly of society type of movie. There are no supernatural elements, just a straight, really dark story, end quote. Uh, Del Toro also revealed the film would be given an R rating. Uh, oh, yikes. Uh, in April 2019, Leonardo DiCaprio entered negotiations to star in the film. Dan Lawson and Andre Desplat were announced to serve as the film's cinematographer and composer, respectively, both having previously collaborated with Del Toro in The Shape of Water. Uh, in June 2019, Bradley Cooper entered early negotiations to replace DiCaprio. Del Toro stated that he and Cooper quickly connected with each other when Del Toro met Cooper in Cooper's house to discuss the role. Um, what am I looking for? What am I looking for? Um, uh, in August 2019, Kate Blanchett was in negotiations to join the film. Both Cooper and Blanchett were confirmed to star the next month, along with the addition of Rooney Mara, Tony Collette, and David Strathairn. Strathairn, I can't, I'm not even 
Okay. <laughs> We're at it in September with stra straight, <laughs> Jesus Christ, replacing Michael Shannon, who dropped out due to scheduling conflicts. Oh, shit. That would have been good with Michael Shannon. Um, Colette praised Del Toro's capabilities as a director and described the film as a period drama and unlike some of his other work. Willem Dafoe was cast in October and Holt McCallany would join the next month. Ron Perlman and Richard Jenkins were both confirmed in January 2020. Uh, they both uh, have collaborated with Del Toro a lot. Ron Perlman is really good friends with Del Toro, as I previously mentioned. Uh, in February 2020, Marion Steenburgen and Romina Power, the daughter of Tyrone Power, joined the cast of the film. In March 2020, Paul Anderson joined the cast of the film. Okay. Principal photography began in January 2020 in Toronto. Uh, production production temporarily moved to buffalo new york in february 2020 in order for del toro to take advantage of the city's architecture and unfamiliar setting uh, scenes were filmed in and outside of buffalo's niagara square and city hall and require the use of fake snow much to the surprise of the crew as buffalo was widely known for its heavy snowfall during the winter season uh, principal photography was initially set to begin in september 2019 but it was delayed to accommodate cooper's schedule um, uh, in March 2020, Del Toro himself shut down production of, on the film after rising concerns regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Guillermo. Um, yeah, Searchlight's parent company, Walt Disney Studios, officially halted production of the film soon after. Well, you know what, Disney, Guillermo will be due to it. Um, Del Toro revealed that when production was shut down, approximately 45% of the film was shot and spent his time editing available footage during the hiatus. Del Toro also composed an 80-page safety precaution guideline to be used when production was to resume, which he was hoping to do in late 2020. Variety reported that Blanchett had completed her scenes prior to the shutdown. I, I love this man even more than I did before reading this. Um, production resumed in September 2020 in Toronto. Um, in an interview, Tony Collette discussed some of the film's safety protocols, saying, uh, quote, I've got to say, I think you couldn't get any safer than a film set. They're so regimented and disciplined and demanding in terms of having to toe the line and everyone has does their best to not get it. You really are in a bubble and the whole of Toronto is in masks and you're just sanitizing your hands a million times a day and trying not to be in big crowds and you just have to be mindful of that, especially when you're working because there's a bigger risk there. It's not just you, it's everyone else you know, quote. Uh, Colette also revealed that Toro had shot almost four hours of footage. By November 2020, principal photography was completed and reshoots had commenced. Production officially wrapped in December 2020. Um... Del Toro and Cooper reflected that the unexpected shooting schedule benefited the film structure. Del Toro remarked that, quote, it was a blessing. I believe wholeheartedly life gives you what you need, not what you want. You have a window to look at everything. It was incredible. We got to see these characters when Stan was full of himself and arrogant and certain and seeking. We were able to go back six months in between all this. We're able to analyze and see not only that character, but what we needed to rewrite to be able to go back to a set. If your pores are open, the movie finds you. Each movie tells you what it needs, end quote. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, Nathan Johnson composed a score for the film after Alexandra, Alexandre Desplat exited due to scheduling conflicts. Yeah. Um, so box office, it made uh, $225,000 from Thursday night previews and estimated $1.19 1 million by Friday. Its low opening was attributed it attributed to it being primarily meant for the audiences of older age ranges uh, who had avoided going out to see movies amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. Low interest among the movie-going audience and the release of Spider-Man No Way Home around the same time. It went on to debut to $2.8 million during the weekend, finishing fifth at the box office. Um, yeah, okay. On Rotten Tomatoes, uh, it has an 80% um, of 246 reviews that are positive with an average rating of 7.4 out of 10. 
uh, the website's critical consensus reads, while it may not hit quite as hard as the original, Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley is a modern noir thriller with pleasantly pulpy spin. Metacritic, which uses a weighted average, assigned a score of 69 out of 100 based on 44 critics, indicating generally favorable reviews. Um, no quotes from uh, any critics on here. Uh, it has been nominated for quite a few awards. Um, it has a, a lot pending at the Critics' Choice Movie Awards for Best Picture, Best Director, uh, Best Cinematography, Best Costume Design, Best Production Design, Best Score, Best Hair and Makeup, and Best Visual Effects. Uh, it's also nominated at the Hollywood Critics Association for Best Director and Best Production Design. Um, it is nominated at the Chicago Film... Oh, it was nominated. Uh, didn't win. Um, at the Chicago... Okay, so yeah, all the ones I'm about to announce have... Uh, already been decided. The ones, the Critics' Choice and Hollywood Critics was are pending. Uh, so uh, it was nominated at the Chicago Film Critics Association for Best Art Direction and Production Design and Best Use of Visual Effects. Uh, at the AFI Awards, um, it was uh, awarded one of the top 10 movies of the year. Uh, it was runner-up for Best Picture at the Dallas-Fort Worth C Film Critics Association and runner-up for Best Production Design at the Los Angeles Film Critics Association. Uh, it won uh, top 10 films so it was at the National Board of Review. Um, at the San Diego Film Critics Society was nominated for Best Director, Best Supporting Actress, Best Cinematography, Best Sound Design, Best Visual Effects, and it won Best, Cinem uh, Best Production Design. Uh, it was nominated for Best Production Design at the St. Louis uh, Film Critics Association as well as the Washington, D.C. Area Film Critics Association. <laughs> so yeah, that's all of that. That is all of that. Um, I actually have seen the 1947 film, so I can actually compare the two in a rare occurrence. <laughs> I don't remember the last time this happened. Maybe, I think... I think the last time this officially happened was with Stepford Wives. Um, yeah. So there's no official, like, thing that says the differences between them. Um, differences that I can remember in the plot is that, um, you don't get the scene of Stan killing his father. Um, you, you'd also, there's shit what else there's oh pete doesn't in the in the original film pete and xena don't straight out teach stan the code and all of that they actually hide it from him saying it's private and then after pete dies he steals the little book that has it all in it uh in in the 2021 film uh pete teaches him and then after he dies xena's just like you can have it um yeah um Clem is an official character in uh, the 1947 film. I don't know if he's a character in the book. I would assume so. Um, but yeah, I'm glad. Thank you, Del Toro, for adding him in uh, because you gave me Willem Dafoe. <laughs> Which is a good role for him, you know. Yeah, he's good at playing those kind of like creepy, weird guy roles. Um, and it gave us the opportunity for a the faux double feature that weekend with uh, No Way Home and Nightmare Alley. I didn't, I was originally going to see them as a double feature and then the day that I had planned to do it, I was too tired. So I only saw Nightmare Alley that day and then I saw No Way Home like a couple days later. Um, but yeah. Um, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, I like it like as much as I liked the original film the original film is fantastic um Nightmare Alley what did I give it okay so I gave the um 1947 film four stars on Letterboxd or four peaches um and I gave the 2021 film four and a half peaches out of five. 
I can't letterbox. I guess you would let me like look at my review and instead of just saying doing that little pop up thing. Let me see what I gave it, man. Let me go to my diary. Um, because I know I wrote a review for it. Um, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Like I have no qualms about it. Other than, like, it was just a really long movie. <laughs> and the original, I just had issues with it because it was just... The stakes weren't that high, you know? That's And that's the main thing I liked about this one is that, like, Guillermo del Toro upped the stakes tremendously. He made it more grisly and, like, graphic, and I loved that. I loved that. You know? Where the fuck is my review? Okay, my review of the 2021 film reads... Uh, Guillermo, you absolute madman. Uh, only Del Toro could take a classic and not only up the stakes, but also make it more riveting and grisly. Uh, my review of the 1947 film, which I actually watched a day before. Oh, shit. Um, it just says not the wood alcohol. <laughs> um, let's read some other reviews from Letterboxd. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Mm, I'm trying to find like an actual full review that's not too long, but uh, yeah. Um, okay, this review is from Tumble Topple. Uh, oh Jesus, their favorite films is just all Tragedy of Macbeth. Okay. What are the, um, I'm trying to find their, uh, pronouns, and I cannot, so, um, their review reads, um, make it about just Kate and Rooney with a touch of Tony, and the Carol stands and gaze will show up in droves. Not shave of water good, but it's a fun little con thriller that will be entertained, uh, for a while. And they gave it three and a half stars. I disagree. I mean, it's not as good as Shape of Water, but it's still fucking good. Um. Yeah. Okay. 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 Um. I'm looking for a review. Bum. Um. <laughs> this review says, uh, Kate Blanchett delivers the closest thing to Faye Dunaway and Mommy Dearest that I've seen in a long time. That's funny. I, no. I want to say the closest thing. She's better than Mommy Dearest. Don't do that to Kate. Um. Yeah. Well. Let me see. Okay, this one's four stars from Brian Formo. Uh, his review reads, uh, Four Course Meal, Psychology versus Spiritualism, Marx and Tells are preyed on by applying pressure to the same truth. Uh, people want to tell you about themselves. One offers insight uh, with a frustrating lack of concrete answers. The other is a fabrication but promises to tell you that you want what you want to hear. I was thoroughly entertained and loved the vast canvas Guillermo del Toro is given for this con job noir. It's spooky, but even better. It's lush and sexy, too. Um, there's more, but I just wanted to read that much. Um, this review reads, if I was in the carnival, I'd just do the stanky leg. Oh my god. Okay, um. Yeah, most of the reviews are, like, mid-tier, which is fine. It is a pretty mid-movie, but it's still really fucking good, and I highly recommend it. Um, oh, I just got my first email from a fucking, um, professor for this semester. I'm gonna not read that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have... I, I like both films quite a bit. The original film has... It's definitely 70s vibes. This is 7 70s. 40s. Jesus Christ. It has 40 vibe, 40, 40s vibes. You know, it's a very 40s noir film. 
um, very, very much of the era. It's, it's good. It's really good. Um, very much of the era, um, that it comes from. Um, oh, Jesus Christ. So, I just clicked on the Wikipedia page, Wikipedia page for the 47 film. The author of the book, uh, died by suicide from sleeping pills in 1962 in the same room in a hotel, in the Hotel Carter where he wrote the first draft of the novel. Oh, no. Um, so, okay, okay, I'm also reading, um, um, the slightly upbeat but somewhat dark and ambiguous ending of the film was added by the screenwriter, uh, the director's, uh, direction, uh, softening the harsh ending of the novel for commercial purposes. Uh, the novel's ending implies that Stanton is doomed to work as a geek until he drinks himself to death. Um, yeah, so in the original film, Okay, now that I'm remembering this, I'm glad I saw that. In the original film, he does go to the carnival and is like, oh my god, doomed to become a geek. But then, um, he goes crazy. Um, however, Molly uh, happens to work at the same carnival. She manages to calm him down and give him hope, bringing things full circle between Stanton and Molly. The Pete and Xena's doomed relationship. So it's slightly hopeful, but you still know he's gonna get fucked up like Pete. Which is a thing that I didn't like about this compared to, you know, the 2021 film in the novel, from what I know about the novel, because uh, I haven't read it. I like the dark ending, um, but having a more hopeful ending is also very indicative of the time, like, uh, you know, people back then going to theaters didn't want, a, a, you know, a, an, um, an unsure ending or like a... Um, an unhappy ending, you know, they didn't want like a, a Shakespearean tragedy type of ending. They wanted a happy ending. Um, and, you know, for commercial purposes, if they had gone with the original ending, it wouldn't have made that much money. It wouldn't, you know, have done as well as it did, which is, I, it's understandable. Um, but I'm glad that um, Del Toro uh, brought back the original ending. <laughs> Um, not to say that the ending of the 47 film is bad, it's still good, but it just kind of kills the vibe, man. Like, you have the scenes at the end where he's like, I was born for this, and he becomes the geek, and he loses his mind, you're like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, full circle. And then Molly shows up, and you're like, the fuck? Where did she come from? You know, you're like, what the hell? And it just kind of killed the vibe. Um, but I recommend both of these films very much. They're both very good. The original film is 111 minutes, uh, so about 40 minutes shorter. Um, yeah, but the, the pacing in the Del Toro film isn't that bad. It's pretty standard. Um, you don't feel every minute, but like it, you, it also doesn't go by super fast. It's just, it paces, you know? Um, the older one is a little bit slow pacing. I think that's just because of the way that films were made back then. Um, the way that films were made back then, the scenes were very slow paced. Um, you know, films now we can up the pacing just a tiny bit so that it's not too fast, but not too slow, but also include more in it. Um, which Guillermo del Toro does, although the film is longer. Um, but yeah. Um, I don't actually know what wood alcohol is, now that I think about it. It's methyl alcohol. Methanol. It's methanol. Um, so it's just regular alcohol. Okay. It's just regular alcohol. I didn't know what, what wood alcohol was until just now. <laughs> yeah. Um, Tyrone Brower's Tyrone Power is pretty hot, no lie. Um, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, the, um, the original film. The actress who plays, uh, Molly, um, what's her name? Colleen Gray. She's very attractive as well. And so is Rooney Mara. I love Rooney Mara. 
I love Tony Collette. I love this cast. I'm not the biggest fan of Bradley Cooper. I think I've said that before. I'm not the biggest fan of Bradley Cooper. Um, so with the exception of me not being a fan of his, I love this cast. I really do. I love Kate. I love Tony. I love Willem Dafoe. Y'all know I love Willem Dafoe. He's my favorite actor. I love Rooney Mara. I love Richard Jenkins. Richard Jenkins is also one of my favorite actors. I love Ron Perlman. I love Mary Steenburgen. I love... I actually don't know who David Straight Heron is, judging by the fact that I did not pronounce his last name. Let me look at the phonetics. Stra... Stratern. Stratern. David Stratern. I was mispronouncing it the whole time. Well, you know what? They didn't have the phonetics on the Nightmare Alley page. What else is this guy in? Um, so Wikipedia, please give me more phonetics for confusing last names. I would very much appreciate it. I like reading phonetics. It's very helpful. Um, that's like the one thing that I learned in high school that actually stuck with me. Aside from, oh, he's in Trumbo. I never watched Trumbo. <laughs> Useless information. Uh, he's in Nomadland. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Th th that, aside from, like, the mitochondria, is probably one of, the, like, learning how to read phonetics is probably the most useful thing I learned in high school. Um, but anyways, that's, that's about it. I, I really enjoyed this film. I don't have much to comment on other than, like, the pacing was just, like, okay. It wasn't great, but it wasn't bad either. I, 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 I can see why other people consider this more like a mid movie. Um, I enjoyed it quite a lot because I already liked the original film. I liked this plot already and I liked Del Toro quite a lot. Uh, I'm a big fan of him. He does noir really well. Um, he's like the man, you know, who has revived noir horror thriller films in the 21st century. Um, he's consistently done this, so it's not his first time doing it. Um, some, some reviews on Letterboxd make it seem like he's never done a noir film before, and I'm like, all his films are noir in some way or another, you know? Um, but it's really, it's really fucking good. Uh, I mean, this, I guess this is just the one that's more like classic noir because it's based off of something that's already noir, but it's incredible. I loved it. I fucking loved it. Um, not my favorite of his, but you know, it's really good and I liked it a lot, um, so I highly recommend it. It's still, I think it's still in theaters. It might have just been pulled from theaters. I think it was just pulled from theaters. Um, yeah, I don't know what the, the, um, timing is for the digital and physical releases, but, um, usually it takes about three months, three to four months before that comes out. Um, but yeah, I very much recommend this film when you get a chance to watch it. Please do. That being said, you can follow me everywhere at Lucky Peach, L V C K Y Peach, as well as um there is a link tree. But what are you gonna say? There's a link tree in the description. And that takes you to my Twitter, my Instagram, my TikTok, my Twitch, my letterboxed, um, Patreon at patreon.com slash lucky peach. Um takes you to the stickers as well takes you to youtube um everything else the stickers um also there's a link below for the stickers instead of just going straight to the link tree you can just go straight there um there's a link to the discord down there as well um yeah you know, if it's if it's important to where you can find me and where you can find the stickers and the podcast it's in the description of the episode um yeah Thank you to my patrons, patreon.com slash lucky peach. Very much appreciate you guys. Um, yeah, I think that's all. I'll see you guys next week for um, the first strong commentary of 2022, uh, chosen by Keon, uh, Mr. Chill Zone, because his birthday is on the. What day is it on? What day is it on? I'm sorry, I'm making a lot of noise. What day is it on? His birthday is on January 28th. So he chose the drunk commentary for this month of Cat in the Hat. Um, so he'll be there. Luis will be there. Um, yeah. So I'll see you guys next week for that. Stay peachy.